operating officer of Prod Perfect, and I'm giving you a uh, hopefully 20 or so minute demo of Prod Perfect end to end. I'm going to cover two things today. First, how does Prod Perfect work? Um, so, how are we building, maintaining, evolving tests? And then, second, what is the experience with Prod Perfect like? So, I'm going to screen share here and start start with my little slide deck on how Prod Perfect works. So. To level set, what ProdPerfect does is we autonomously build, maintain, and evolve end-to-end -end test automation for web applications. So think of us at almost as like a QA team in a box, right? Normally you'd, you'd put a bunch of QA automation engineers, throw, you know, get them, throw them at your application, have them meet with a bunch of people, figure out what to test, decide what to test, execute, build those tests, maintain those tests, evolve those tests over time. Um, we do this ourselves with using our software and some humans to back it up, which I'll actually talk about the humans. Um, and it's, of course, a you know better, faster, stronger, cooler experience. There's two main advantages to using Prod Perfect. One, you don't have to do it, right? So it's an abstraction, just as um, abstracting away your infrastructure to AWS rather than holding on to your own um, bare metal server system, right? So that abstraction on its own is highly valuable. Um, and second, because we're using data to determine what to test, we have we can just build a better test suite than any group of humans ever could. So how do we do it? So first, we're collecting metadata from production, seeing how users use the application. This is by installing a JavaScript snippet in prod. Second, um, we're building test cases um, by understanding patterns of behavior on the application. So we're able to see how people use the application. There's a lot of data science here to get those patterns from the noise. Those patterns are our test cases. This is how we know we're testing what's important to your users. We're making sure their experience doesn't break. This is sort of like the ideal of regression testing. And then finally, this is the hard part actually, is translating those into end-to-end -end tests by filling in test data um, and adding assertions. I'm gonna talk about both of those. So, your experience running these tests, which we'll get to in greater detail in the second half of this demo, is simple. It's almost as if you'd written the test themselves. We host the tests, so we host the infrastructure to run them. We host the repo. You can access that repo. You can download the repo. The tests are your property, but let us run them. Um, you kick them off using CI. And um, so just like your own test suite, it's a script. It runs against whatever the target test environment is. So they don't have to run against prod, even though we learn what to do from prod, we test against a test environment. Um, you get results in our cool app, Mission Control, which I'll show off. This is where the developer experience gets really cool. Um, and then over time, what's happening is we're constantly analyzing this data that's coming in every single hour. And so we notice differences emerge between user behavior in the test suite, either new features or change features. We're able to change those tests to keep up. So real quick on how we do it. Let me just, there we go. So I'm going to skip through a lot of this stuff for the moment um, to get you just a better idea of how. So. The kind of data we collect is metadata about an event. So we're just seeing HTML element or HTML metadata about the event, about the element um, that's being interacted with. So we see a user going through, they have a UID, they have a timestamp, right? So we can trace their path through passively. Um, but this is what we see. What we don't see is, for example, what someone put in a form. So if someone types in the email form, we see that they interacted with the email form, but not what they put in it, because we're just getting that elemental metadata. Um, and so I mentioned this, and this is the what the snippet looks like um, at a high level. It points to a library. If you guys need to self-host, that's fine. Um, and then the sequence of events that pops out of that then needs test data. And so we have logins to your test environment. Um, and what happens is what's, what's kind of like reverse browser automation is driving through, um, trying to figure out through a guess and check process what data to put into the test in order to make it work. The reason we can do this is we already know what a success looks like because we know the sequence of events, right? So if we can get through that sequence of events, the test study that we put in works. Part of our QC is to run a test 10 times before we ship it to make sure that you know, the data that we put in it is reliable and stable. So um, I'm gonna walk you through an example. So Geico is not a customer, but we have other car insurance customers where, um, you know, for example, let's say that we have an event path you know, a, a sequence of events, a test case that is 
um, get passenger car insurance. You see it has this event path in this, you know, people fill this out in this order. If it was motorcycle insurance, it would be different. And so when the machine, let's say it's assigned the passenger car um, sequence, right, test case, we don't know conceptually, right, what the, um, you know, the prod perfect engine doesn't understand conceptually that it's passenger cars. They just, it just sees the sequence of events. And so what it does is it from this drop down, it's going to iteratively select different options until it sees this sequence of events. And when it does, it goes, aha, this is the right data. I'm going to ship that to the test code, right? It's going to get inserted into the test. And then going through here, you know, we have to fill all these forms out. So you, let's say we ran into a VIN for the first time, right? machine doesn't know what the heck a VIN is. And so it's going to, it may even try to guess something, but eventually it'll fall over because a VIN is a very, a vehicle identification number is a very specific alphanumeric sequence that Geico will only accept if it's correct, right? So, um, so for a test VIN to work, we might even need to like Google, or if you have a very specific test VIN that will work, um, you know, and others don't work, we may even need to ask you. That's a second escalation. But let's say we can just Google it. It gets passed to a mechanical Turk right, who's a crowdsourced human, who can just Google it. And once that's put in and it's accepted, it gets shipped back to the test and the process updates so that it gets better at guessing what should go in a VIN next time. So we've mastered stuff like credit cards at this point because we've seen it so many times, right? And there's other stuff that's going to need some mechanical Turk support. If things really fall over, we need an engineer to intervene. That'll be on our team. So we have this like little, you know, we have this like small group of operational engineers who support this whole process in the middle, a bigger group of a crowd, and at the bottom, some automation. Um, and that's how we build the test data into the test suite. We're going to scope with you guys ahead of time um, what your test data management strategy looks like so we don't like break it, right? And we can take advantage of what you've already done in order to make this happen faster. So once we have a some browser automation that can get through it, we need some assertions. And so the principle we have for assertions is, since we don't know the underlying business logic, what we're going to do is say, look, we're putting in a certain data set X, whatever is returned, we're going to assume when we're building the test that there's not a regression in the application, right, in the test version of the application. And so that assumption allows us to say what data is being returned on the DOM that is provoked by what we did, right, by what interactions we had and what data we put in. So a good example here, again, Amazon, not a customer, but I recently bought some headphones so I bought those, you notice they have this price $15.99, but we're still be of cert on the $17.51 because we're consistently putting in California as the shipping address. We're consistently putting in, you know, as the test runs, consistently putting in um, these headphones. And the $17.51 is going to come back because of California's sales tax. And if your sales tax calculator breaks, we'll notice because it will be like, oh, it's, you know, like we're, we're looking for that $17.51 and it would be different. Um, similarly, you know, we use a straight credit card. We're making sure we see these indicators that the shopping experience was successful. And we can even use MailSAC um, to assert on confirmation emails or even respond to confirmation emails for like a sign up flow, right? Where you need to like confirm your email address. And so that's how we make sure that this whole test is working and that it's meaningful. And that's how a test is built. Um, you know, there are other details we can talk about, but I'm trying to keep this quick. What I wanna do is show off what a finished test looks like or test suite looks like. So this is a very simple um, customer of ours, Negotiatus. They let us kind of show off everything. They've got a test suite for their buyer side application. They have multiple test suites, but their buyer side application um, has 30. And it covers this kind of like magical two thirds of the observe of behavior that we observe. Um, and actually let me go to pre-launch and show you. Um, so if you like sign up with us, we, you know, we get integrated, you can see data being collected. You can see traffic being analyzed. You can see your test being built during this ramp up period. And we, we look for this magical 65%. Um, we have one test that's skipped right now and being added, but we look for this magical 65% um, of observed user behavior where each test represents, you know, each test, each test coverage represents the total user behavior that it covers divided by the total user behavior that we have observed. And then we add all those tests together in a non-overlapping way um, in order to get this total. So we see here, for example, user can check out, right? Well, it's a purchasing app. So 28% uh, of all behavior is that, right? So we know we need to prioritize this. And then same thing further down the line, um, we're able to prioritize these tests that, again, these are non-overlapping. So these look quite small, um, but they're actually much bigger because there's some overlap with previous tests. But um, so what we're able to do is build these tests based on priority of how often people use them. Um, and we get a test suite. 
uh, once we cross that magical 65%. Because past 65%, things get pretty noisy. It's hard to tell the difference between rare behavior and noise. Um, and so here's here's a test suite. Let's look at add product to cart and check out. So I'd mentioned, you know, this sequence of events, type to, you know, and, and data. So we're typing some text in, we're clicking stuff, and then these assertions. So everything I just described, you're, you know, about how to build a test, you're able to see through mission control deep details about exactly what this test is doing. So your QA leads can understand the test in depth. They can understand it holistically by seeing a video of the test running and make sure, like, okay, this makes sense. Um, and so a QA lead is likely at the beginning of a pilot with us going to want to inspect this. So um, as the test suite changes, uh, you know, of course, QA leads want to see some of these updates. We alert you, of course, when the test suite gets updated in a, in a meaningful way as opposed to simply repair. Um, the real magic of Prob Perfect, of course, is our ability to run tests at high speed um, that are very, very effective because we have data um, telling us what's important to test, well, it means we also have data telling us what's not important to put in an end-to-end -end test suite, right? In a browser automation test suite. Um, and so our test suites can run really lean. So uh, this test suite's often running 11 minutes, sometimes 14, sometimes 15. If there's a failure, it's obviously longer. Um, but what's cool is uh, this means that you can actually run prop perfect continuously with every deploy. Um, or with every time code is checked in, not necessarily at the end of a sprint. So you can radically change the deployment cycle for a customer um, rather than, you know, rather than having this like day long or, or I mean, we know customers that have a week long QA cycle. What if we could bring end to end testing into the dev cycle, right? That they run at the same time or right after unit tests run. And so devs can get immediate feedback. So let's say we're a dev, you know, we've, we've um, checked in code or we've, we've issued a PR and the proper test suite runs against the test environment with the update. Right. Usually you get a green light in CI. You know, we see a lot of green lights here. Um, uh, Negotiate is actually is a really good deployment system. So they're very clean. And you can see us sort of keeping up here, right? Like when there's a set of failures, this is a stabilization failure. We're able to go repair it quickly. Um, that's why we're running the stabilization runs every hour. Um, but Negotiate does a great job. And so when, um, and we do a great job keeping these tests stable. So when there's a failure, you see this is a customer initiated run. It was run in CI. There's a failure. This is probably a bug. Um, and this just happened, you know, today's May 25th, uh, one my time, this is 11 my time. So I don't even know what's going on here, but we're about to find out together. So um, we can view this report and what's gonna happen is if you're that dev and you get a red light on CI saying like, hey, the proper for test suite failed, you're gonna get a link to directly this page. So this URL will be in your CI so you can get here and you go, what the heck happened? So split checkout item, um, What's going to happen? We should we can look at this error. Here's the expectation, the assertion that failed is we're looking for a certain match of a variable that we didn't get. This red text, I've never seen it before. This is probably a problem that we tried to split the item and the item ended up not being split. This very much looks to me like a bug, which is exciting, right? We might have just caught a bug two hours before I made this video. Um, and that's what really what we get paid to do is right autonomously catch bugs for you um, and catch them quickly. So the developer might even be doing this now, who knows, um, but can look at the last time the test ran successfully and the time that it failed um, in order to be able to compare these. And uh, this test runs pretty quickly. Um, we're not going to try to diagnose the whole thing right now, um, but it's cool. This is this is debugging that's like live in live in action right now. Um, I'm not going to go through this because they're probably using it. But, um, but just in case a developer can't replicate the problem on their dev environment, right, on their laptop, um, they can use PodPerfect's VNC in order to create the exact same environment and conditions that the bug happened in order to make sure they replicate it. And PodPerfect's debugger has this really cool um, like console functionality to make it much easier to debug quickly. That's the whole point for the developer experience, right? So from a perspective of, of like a QA team or, or people who think about QA, this is a hands-off, data-driven, great test suite. From the perspective of a developer, it's a no BS, uh, no instability, very low false positives, very quick debugging experience that they love and helps them move much faster. Those are the two main reasons people buy Prod Perfect. Um, and the last thing I want to note, because it would just help add some clarity, is sometimes, like, uh, so I mentioned, like, very rarely are there false positives, right? And when I say very rarely, there are false positives in terms of whether this is a bug because we're not coordinating with your team on updating these tests, which means when you ship a UI change, tests are gonna break, probably. 
And if those tests break, and these are only meaningful UI changes, it's not like moving a button kind of across the screen, because using a model of, you saw all that metadata about an event, we're using a model of that metadata, such as if it's in a slightly different place, if like, you know, it's positioned on the DOM changes, no big deal. But um, if there's a meaningful change, you change an ad bar to a hamburger, you add some steps, you move some steps and something, whatever, you'll be making those changes, prompt perfect tests will break, right? And so developers need to anticipate like they are gonna break, um, and it may be an intentional change rather than an unintentional change. What's happening on Prompt Perfect side is we are constant, we have humans reviewing every single failed test because many of those tests are tests that we just need to repair. Um, and the quick, the quick way that we patch tests is by using our own record and play tool, which we'll be releasing to you to add custom tests, which is the last thing I'll cover. Um, we'll be releasing that, but we use a record and play tool to fix, to fix tests that need repair as opposed to our bugs. When it's, when it's either obviously a bug or it's not clear, we're going to submit an incident. Um, and that incident's going to hang out until you've repaired the bug. So in this case, um, it looks like someone uh, for, you know, switch indexing from one to zero by mistake on the database. Uh, boom, we've got a problem. Um, this has been repaired because it's ancient. It simply hasn't been acknowledged yet. This is something that our CS team would, um, would intervene or would talk to you about and say, hey, acknowledging this is going to be important. But if we think it's a bug and it's not, you can reject it. And if it's rejected, we'll just go repair the test. And that's how we keep up in the short cycle before we see the UI update go live to prod and update the test suite accordingly. And so that's how we make sure that it doesn't become a mess as you're sending updates. Last thing I wanna cover is um, like how we build test suites. So we've talked to Brian about multiple test suites and the way we think about test suites, remember that magic 65% number, um, it turns out if you split the data into two test suites or four test suites, um, you're going to get more tests and you're going to get better focus on however we split it. So a frequent way of splitting our test suites is by user role. So um, different user roles, such as like, you know, shopper, uh, you know, buyer versus seller, admin versus regular user, right? Those proper is focused on experience, you know, the regression of the user's experience in the sense of functional experience, right? Can this user do the thing that they need to do consistently? Um, and so splitting by user role or even splitting by URL group is pretty frequent for us. Um, and it's where we build multiple test suites. It's the way that we work with you to get the total coverage that you want for your application or that you need for your application. Um, and so we have some customers that have many test suites. Um, Etsy is one of them. So we see here, they've got a bunch um, uh, and, and they, you know, some of their stuff is split by um, user role, but, uh, but a lot of it is split by um, you know, checkout is its own thing. This is the shopping page. Um, this is Etsy mobile. So this is a mobile experience that we could do, you know, we could test your mobile experience by splitting that data. So um, that's how we're going to get multiple test suites. And the last thing to note is these custom tests. So um, custom tests are, I mentioned that record and play tool. So you can use that record and play tool to record a test on your own and ship it to Prod Perfect and say, hey, can you maintain this? The reason for that is that because it's hard, sometimes hard to differentiate noise from um, rare edge cases, some of those edge cases really matter. And we know that we're gonna miss them and that you guys, you know, your team may need more coverage from us. And so um, we allot a number of test cases per test suite. You use those test cases, ship them to us um, and we maintain them for you as part of a service, not an extra charge because we want, um, you know, we of course just want this experience to be truly something that you can offload to us in full. So that's the proper experience.